always do this. You miss, yes? Always do this. It's yeah. last time you didn't do this. Huh? Last time you didn't do this. Yeah, now I always do this because I had bad experience uh, with even with big big media, with big media. So mm -hmm. I no, give no, interview no. to. What does it look for? I mean, if you no, do this, no, it will be. They sometimes ask me to give them this because they they <laughs> fucked up. The okay. <laughs> I gave interview to Dr. Phil. You know Dr. Phil yeah, in the United yeah, States. Yeah. Twenty-minute interview and so on and so forth. The, the, they had a problem with the audio. Luckily, I had I recorded it. I gave them the audio, <laughs> so everything was okay. <laughs> Always good to have multiple. I hope I, pro uh, I pronounce his name right. Uh, you are Noah Harari, you know the great Israeli history, and said uh, before the Ukraine and Russian war that uh, there's uh, there's going to be no war like like traditional war because of the threat of the nuclear weapons. And then it happened. In, uh, when uh, when did the, the war start? In March? February. In February. And you know, the, uh, some uh, weeks just... Um, some weeks later, Putin said that he will push the button if it's necessary. So, what was your first thought when you heard that the, this war just started? And what do you think about the Hawaii's uh, opinion about this? Warfare is a is a human human activity. Uh, the existence of a potentially uh, terminal or final weapon, weapon of extinction, will not deter us. Will not prevent us from having wars. And so I disagree with him completely. Um, warfare has fulfilled multiple very important functions in the life of individuals and the life of collectives. For example, most scientific advances are driven by war and the military. Mm -hmm. Everything you have in your smartphone was invented for the military, GPS, etc. Uh, war trains people, uh, especially men, uh, to bond, bond together and collaborate in large groups. War is an integral part of politics and geopolitics, like Clausewitz said, you know, the war is continuation of di diplomacy by other means. War is a method of signaling. We use war to signal to each other, for example, how determined we are. Mm -hmm. War also rearranges, reallocates economic resources and, and geographic uh, resources. So it's a method of allocation of scarcity, scarce resources. I can continue. War has dozens of functions. In this sense, war is necessary. It's needed. It is, of course, um, unfortunate that civilians and, and military have to die in war. But we could not manage without a war as a species. We don't have any other, any alternative mechanism except war to accomplish all these goals. Okay, but you are Noah Harari also said that, we, that the whole world should focus on climate change, for example, because there is a big issue here. And there are lots of lots of money spent on war, for, like this, for example. What do you think about this? Yes, we should focus on climate change, but not on the way that we are doing. We are trying to reverse climate change. That's nonsense. This will never happen. Climate change is here, and it's going to happen. All the catastrophes, all the calamities that we are predicting are here, and they're going to happen. And they're going to happen in five to ten years, not in five hundred years. So it's here. Instead of investing so much money trying to reverse climate change, we should invest the same money accepting climate change and adapting ourselves to climate change. For example, we should already begin to move cities from the coast in, inward. We should begin to build dams and levees. We should begin to control rivers. We should begin to switch to certain types of agriculture, other types of agriculture which re react the yields and crops that which react much better to higher temperatures, etc., etc. We should redesign our lives, our econom economies, our our architecture, our everything. We should redesign every aspect to accept climate change. Yes, but it costs a lot of money, and it needs some kind of relaxation. I mean, if, if there's a war, the focus is going on another topic. So, actually, they need. We can do. We can do both. We can we can tackle the climate change and we can we can continue to have wars. Um, I don't think we will ever stop having wars. The problem is that we deny. Mm -hmm. This is this is my field. I'm a psychologist. So the problem is that we deny. We see the catastrophe coming 
and we, we lie to ourselves and we say, oh, we, there is still something we can do about it. There is nothing we can do about climate change. Mm -hmm. Nothing. It's too late. And what about nuclear threat? Because Harald said that there's going to be no war, like the radiation or war, because of the nuclear threat. So that nobody will you know, uh, invade any other country because of this, because of this fear. So was it it's a stupid uh, only someone Only someone who doesn't know the first thing about nuclear weapons would say this. Mm -hmm. there, there, are, there are multiple types of nuclear weapons. Mm -hmm. Of course, no one would use a hydrogen bomb. But we have low-yield nuclear weapons, which resemble very strong explosives. We have tactical nuclear weapons. We have even bullets, which are nuclear. So 50 years ago, nuclear weapons were weapons of mass extinction. Today, they're not. Today, they are simply another way of delivering explosives. So yes, of course, Russia, for example, could use a low-yield tactical nuclear weapon to destroy part of Kiev. That's totally, but um, the United States did it in the 40s with Dresden. After that, they destroyed Nagasaki and Hiroshima. Mm -hmm. These are acceptable behaviors in war and predictable behaviors. So nuclear weapons today have become mainstream. They are integrated in the strategy of all major and minor powers. Nine countries have nuclear weapons now, and there is a proliferation. I think within... 50 years, 30, 40 countries will have nuclear weapons. The use of nuclear weapons is inevitable in this war, in the future war. Again, we are fighting, again, we are denying. Again, we are saying climate change, we could reverse it, we could control it. We cannot. We are saying nuclear war will never happen. It will. These are all pathological mechanisms of coping with fear. We are terrified, so we lie to ourselves and to others. Instead of saying, let us face reality and prepare for reality, design for reality. For example, cons begin to construct nuclear bunkers and nuclear shelters everywhere. Everywhere, because every part of the globe can be subject to nuclear attack. Mm -hmm. Or even acquiring nuclear weapons as a, an acceptable mean thing. Today, a country is not allowed to acquire nuclear weapons. There's a non-proliferation treaties all over the place. So if you acquire a nuclear weapon, you become a pariah. You become, you're punished, mm -hmm. like Iran and North Korea and so on. I think we should do exactly the opposite. We should encourage countries to have nuclear weapons. Mm -hmm. Because the more nuclear, more countries have nu nuclear weapons, the larger the number of countries with nuclear weapons, the, the less the likelihood of war. Not more, less. Mm -hmm. If I know that my enemy has a nuclear weapon, I'm less likely to start a war unless there is very good reason. Mm -hmm. So we are doing everything reverse. We are doing everything wrong. And of course, the situation is catastrophic. And what do you think that how come Putin didn't use it? And he hasn't used it so far. He hasn't used it yet. First of all, he was utterly shocked and surprised by the developments in the war, mm -hmm. I think. He, I think from the very beginning, the focus was Donbass. The rest of Ukraine is not valuable. The rest of Ukraine is meaningless. Donbass is the industrial heartland of Ukraine. Donbass is where the minerals are, where the industries are. Where Donbass is Ukraine. <laughs> it's the engine of Ukraine. So he wanted to capture that part. Who wants to capture Kiev? What are you going to do with Kiev? No one wants to do it. But I don't think he predicted the West's commitment, commitment of the West mm -hmm. to the war. So the West transformed it into a proxy war, similar to, in some ways, to Vietnam or, or Korea, Korean War. It's a war between the, the great powers fought on a third country's territory. He didn't predict this. He thought the West would, uh, if, his, if his goals are limited, the West would leave it be, leave it alone. And he did not predict the resistance of the Ukrainians. So he's in, he's in, a, in a bad shape now. He's in a bad shape because he has to mobilize people. Right now, he's mobilizing minorities. He's mobilizing Dagestanis and Chechens. He's actually not touching white, middle-class Russians. This category is not touching. Mm -hmm. He's recruiting the poor, the ignorant, the minorities, especially the hated minorities. And so everyone is happy. But that will not be enough. 300,000 untrained people mm -hmm. are not enough. To win the war in Ukraine, 
he needs between two and three million people, at least. So he will have to recruit another million and a half people. That means that he will begin to recruit people from the Russian white middle class. That would endanger his regime. So Putin now is faced with one or two of two choices. He can continue a traditional conventional war, mobilizing big parts of the Russian population, touching on the interests of the elites and the middle class, endangering his regime, or he can terminate the war by using tactical nuclear weapons in specific uh, locations. If I were Putin, I would of course use nuclear weapons. That's the logical thing to do, the rational thing to do. What Putin doesn't know, I think, is how the West would react to this. If he uses low-yield tactical nuclear weapons in locations without, which are depopulated, without population, so if he destroys only infrastructure, and so on, I don't think the West will do anything. But if, of course, he uses tactical nuclear weapons and hundreds of thousands of people die, or tens of thousands of people die, then he will remain even without the support of China and uh, India. The problem of Putin is that in Ukraine, there is no such thing as infrastructure separated from population. You don't have this, as in Russia, for example. Mm -hmm. In Russia, you have huge infrastructure projects and no population around them, or in them, mm -hmm. but not in Ukraine. In uh, the nuclear plant is inside the city. The, everything is integrated, population, and, and so he, he, he's uh, stuck, because if he uses nuclear weapon and kills 50,000 people, no one will support him. Not inside Russia, no one will support him outside. China, India, they, they would let him go, they would uh, keep their distance. So he's a, he has a dilemma here. He has a dilemma. So what he's doing now, he's threatening to use nuclear weapons. He thinks maybe that'll be enough. He hopes it will be enough. Mm -hmm. But no one believes him. So what I would do if I were Putin, I would detonate a nuclear weapon in an area which has no population and no infrastructure. Mm -hmm. a desert, a place where, with nothing. <laughs> Just to show that I'm willing to use nuclear weapon. Mm -hmm. So it's a signal. I would signal. I would not make damage. I would not kill anyone. But I would signal that I'm serious. And then hope that this threat of nuclear war will change the rules of the game. That, for example, the Ukrainian government would be willing to negotiate with me on some territorial division or concessions. And, and I think that could be the next phase. A detonation of a nuclear device without any damage to infrastructure or to people as a signal and then an attempt at diplomacy. To, mm -hmm. to sit with the Ukrainians under international auspices, Turks, I don't know who else, Germans and so on, and to try to reach some kind of agreement. Do you think that he could be reacting from the European Union or the NATO? No one will react. If he, if he doesn't damage or kill anyone, no one will do anything. Mm -hmm. No one will do anything. It will be an incentive to negotiate, incentive mm -hmm. to resort to diplomacy, because the escalation will be clear. After this detonation, he will have to strike a population center or an industrial zone. If, if, the, if, this, if this signal is not perceived correctly, and he's pushed even more to the corner, then he will use nuclear weapons on population centers mm -hmm. and industrial areas. And what do you think about the sanctions? Because lots of people, not just here in Hungary, but there are in other countries as well, that lots of people say that it's not our war. Why do we have sanctions on, on, on Russia? In Russia. What do you think about this? It is uh, Western propaganda that Putin intends to recreate the USSR, mm -hmm. that he mm -hmm. intends to retake all the territories that the USSR has lost under Gorbachev. You know? mm -hmm. So he's, he's planning to invade the Baltic states, or he's planning to retake Poland, and you know. <coughs> this is nonsense. He has no intention of doing any of this. Ukraine is a different story. Ukraine historically is the beginning of, of Russia. The Kiev principality a thousand years ago was the beginning of Russia. Ukraine, who used to be a part of Russia, Ukraina means the border, borderland. That's the border of Russia. Some parts of Ukraine, like Crimea, never belonged to Ukraine. They were given to Ukraine by the Communist Party. Ukraine, uh, 
some part of the population of Ukraine, about 20-30%, are actually Russians and Russian speakers and ethnic Russians. The, there is a close affinity between Russians and Ukrainians. Russians calls, call the Ukrainians small brothers, little brothers. You know? mm -hmm. So Ukraine is, is totally different. Ukraine is not Latvia. Ukraine is not Hungary. Ukraine is not Poland. Ukraine is the heartland of, of Russia in the eyes of many Russians. So the war there will not spread. There's no risk that it, it will spread. However, to declare such a war, to invade another country, to violate sovereignty, to cross international borders, to attack population centers, this undermines the international order. It's not about whether Putin will attack other parts of Europe. He will not. Everyone knows that. But it's about Putin destroying the international order after the Second World War. Mm -hmm. It's the order that guaranteed peace in, in Europe. So he's challenging. He's challenging the organizing principle of peace in the international community. Okay, but what about the militia, for example? Because I think they're very, very close friends of Putin. So it's not invaded by the Russians, but actually they are there. I mean, yes. So lots of people would think that, okay, first, Belarusia, Belarusia, Ukraine, and then the other. No, there's no Belarus, Ukraine, and then the other. Mm -hmm. The status of Belarus and Ukraine is very, very, very special. Mm -hmm. It's like if Hungary one day will invade Romania. Mm -hmm. It will invade Romania because there are parts of Romania that Hungarians consider to be part of historical Hungary. But Hungary will not invade Sweden because it invaded Romania. Mm -hmm. You know, Same with Israel. Israel invaded, uh, actually Israel conquered, occupied parts of Jordan, including mm -hmm. Jerusalem. But Israel will never invade, I don't know, Saudi Arabia, because it invaded uh, Lebanon. There are, there are historical spaces. We operate within historical spaces. Russia has no common history with the Baltic states, for example. No real common has history with the Baltic states. But it does have a very long uh, affiliation and common history with Belarus and Ukraine. It's natural for Russia to try to conquer Ukraine and Belarus, because mm -hmm. many Russians, maybe majority of Russia, regard Belarus and Ukraine as parts of Russia. So most countries in Europe lost 50-60% of their territory, Hungary included. Mm -hmm. you know. all, all countries in Europe have a greater, a greater dream, like greater Hungary, greater Albania, greater Macedonia, greater Serbia, all, all countries have this. And similarly, Russia. There is Russia proper, there's a core, mm -hmm. but there is a greater Russia, which includes Ukraine and Belarus, but not, for example, um, I don't know, Hungary. Russia has no presumptions on Hungary. It will never invade Hungary. We'll never invade uh, Sweden. We'll never invade, uh, you know, it's, it's idiotic. But Russia may invade part of Poland. There are, there are parts of Poland which, are, which Russians consider Russia. That may happen. I don't believe in that because of NATO. But mm -hmm. there's not been NATO yet. Mm -hmm. Poland is. So you are not believing sanctions in the capital of the people? Sanctions were needed because, mm -hmm. because of the destruction of the international order. Mm -hmm. Not because of the invasion, but he destroyed the international order. Sanctions, the sanctions are, are more a signal. They're symbolic. Sanctions are symbolic. They didn't touch the core of the Russian economy. It's impossible to touch the core of the Russian economy because Russia is 17% of the planet and Russia is the biggest oil producer and Russia controls 8 out of 10, 10 major metals. It's impossible to put sanctions on Russia. Yeah, but it is because of our issues and other economy. That's the irony. I think, I think the sanctions are directed mostly at the West, not at Russia. Mm -hmm. Russia will find ways to sell its oil. To China, to India, mm -hmm. they are big buyers now. Russia is collaborating with OPEC in OPEC Plus. Russia is in a, uh, Russia is suffering l of the sanctions less than the West. Mm -hmm. that's, that's why I call it these are sanctions on the West, not on Russia. Russia will turn off the gas. Europe is in serious trouble. Russia will refuse to sell certain minerals. The whole, the whole information technology and high tech industry will collapse. Russia will collaborate with China about rare earth minerals, mm -hmm. and we will not have smartphones. Mm -hmm. 
We are critically dependent on Russia and China now, uh, as a West. We are crit critically dependent on these two. And so the sanctions were not real. The sanctions were directed at the financial system mm -hmm. and at individuals to take a yacht, to take a house. <laughs> and so the, the fun sanctions are a joke, essentially. Mm -hmm. If you look, at the, if you look um, at, the, at the barometers of sanctions, one of the main indicators whether sanctions are working or not is the currency. When the West imposed sanctions on Turkey, the currency collapsed completely by 80-90%. When the West imposed sanctions on Iran, the currency collapsed totally. It became 10% of its previous value. Currency is the main thermometer. tells you if it, sanctions are working or not. I just changed rubles that I had, and I got a better rate than before the war. Mm -hmm. Ruble now is in better shape than before the war. So it has zero effect on the currency. On the contrary, the currency became stronger. Mm -hmm. That's a, that's a strong indicator that the sanctions are not working. Mm -hmm. They're not working. Uh, uh, am I right that you resigned from the university? I mean, you you, yeah. you were teaching in what what is Turin University? I, I just missed. I was um, I was teaching in Southern Federal University. Yes, I was teaching in Southern Federal University. So um, Russia has a. Um, uh, tiers has levels, a hierarchy of universities. So you have like um, regional universities and a state uni like university, then, and the highest level is called federal. Mm -hmm. There are five federal universities. Mm -hmm. I was teaching in the Federal University of the South. The problem is that all these universities have contracts with the Ministry of Defense. Mm -hmm. So to teach in any one of these universities, the federal you need to have FSB clearance, clearance from the FSB. FSB is the successor of the KGB. So it takes a year, it takes about a year. And in this year, I was invited multiple times, many times, to be interrogated by FSB colonels and so on and so forth mm -hmm. about everything, my sex life, my, my everything, yeah. absolutely, every, every dimension, every aspect. Um, I was even subjected to medical tests, um, which I... Uh, I suspect they search my clothes. Uh, it's, it's protocol everywhere in the world or just no, in Russia? Only a foreigner who wants to teach in a university that is working with the Ministry of Defense. Okay. But in Russia? In Russia, okay. of course. So, federal university is like this. So, mm -hmm. I, I got an FSB clearance, which is exceedingly rare. Mm -hmm. By 2017, to the best of my knowledge, I may be wrong, but to the best of my knowledge, I was the only foreigner teaching in Russia. Mm -hmm. No one else received that clearance. And so, when the war started, I lost my clearance with Russia, because I'm an Israeli, and Israel is keeping a neutral position, uh -huh. and even supplying Ukraine. Israel is supplying Ukraine with defensive um, equipment, and weaponry, mm -hmm. which is very surprising, because in Israel there are two million Russians. So, Israel is one-third Russian. Mm -hmm. It's another Russian oblast, <laughs> in a way. It's very bizarre that Israel chose Ukraine, I think, under pressure from the West. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But it chose Ukraine. So Israelis don't receive any... They were banned. They were not allowed to enter Russia. And then I lost my clearance. The irony is, I was then approached by Harvard University and Ministry of Defense of Ukraine. And they asked me to give... Um, um, to teach local Ukrainian psychologists and psychiatrists mm -hmm. how to treat People with PTSD, post-traumatic stress mm -hmm. disorder. Mm -hmm. So, for example, women who were raped, children who lost their families, people who were subjected to rocket attacks, they developed trauma, extreme trauma. And the local psychologists don't know, don't know the latest. So I was invited to teach the local psychologists, you know, free of charge, just to teach. Mm -hmm. And I said immediately, yes, I wanted to go in August to Kiev and to begin to teach, to train, to train the but because I was, uh, I lived a total of eight years in Russia, because I was cleared by the FSB, and because all my clients in Russia are the top politicians and the top oligarchs, so the Ukrainians refused to give me security clearance. Mm -hmm. So I did not get security clearance from Russia, and I did not get security clearance from Ukraine. Everyone is suspecting me <laughs> with the other. There's a little paranoia in war, and I could not go to Ukraine. I lost my position in university mm -hmm. and I could not go to Ukraine. Mm -hmm. Do you, I mean, for example, Putin has a, Putin goes to Saudi, what do you think? 
I don't know, I've never met him and uh, people around him don't discuss his health very yeah, much. Yeah. Uh -huh. you know, so I, I have no idea. Putin, I have no idea what's going on with mm -hmm. him. He is clearly, he suffers from mental health issues, but uh, and I doubt very much that he gets uh, treated <laughs> for mental health issues. Mm -hmm. But why do you think so that he has some? He doesn't have some, he has most, uh, most mental issues. Like, uh, yeah, because there were lots of interviews and articles about his mental status and so on and so forth. What is his problem? He's a psychopath, there is little doubt about this. Mm -hmm. so he has antisocial personality disorder mm -hmm. at the extreme end of the spectrum, so he's a psychopath. He is also um, paranoid which is helpful in Russia, it's a survival strategy, it's good to be paranoid. But he's paranoid, he has persecutory delusions, he's a hypochondriac, in other words, he's mm -hmm. uh, obsessed with germs and, and infections and all kinds of things. He's a narcissist, I have little doubt that he has narcissistic personality disorder, he's grandiose. He's delusional, he has delusional disorder, which could be the result of long-term long isolation from the, from from other people. He's surrounded by a small group of people mm -hmm. and he listens only to them. So it's an echo chamber. He never gets input from the environment. If you're isolated from reality for a very long time, you become delusional. So he has delusional disorder. He is not fit. He is not fit to govern. There's no question about this. This man needs treatment and medication. He is um, ill. He is mentally ill, in my mind, to my mind. Mm -hmm. And of course, I've heard from many people in his circle and other oligarchs and so on. I, I heard a lot of, not about his mental health, but I heard a lot of uh, experiences they had with him, mm -hmm. meetings they had with him, interactions they had with him, and so on and so forth. He's, um, what was their experience? Sorry? What was their experience? He is very aggressive man, very violent, uh, even verbally, mm -hmm. uh, aggressive and violent. He, if you dare to say no, and so on, he is uh, punitive, he punishes severely, he destroys your life. He, is, uh, he has no concept of morality or moral compass of any kind. It's a classic description of psychopath. Mm -hmm. He is very anxious. Today we know the newest, the newest, uh, the newest con consensus on psychopathy is that psychopaths actually have anxiety disorder. The psychopathy is compensation for very deep anxiety. He's very anxious man. Mm -hmm. So he catastrophizes a lot. He, he projects that he's calm and he's in control and he's, but he's actually quite hysterical and mm -hmm. co in a constant state of panic. So a very bad picture, which the only similar profile I know from history would be Adolf Hitler. The only mm -hmm. similar profile. Psychologically, he's not. He's not Adolf Hitler. He's very far from Adolf Hitler. He's even far from Joseph Stalin. But he resembles these two. There mm -hmm. are profiles of Stalin and Hitler constructed by the OSS. The OSS was the predecessor of the CIA. So in 1943-44, they hired a professor of psychology from Harvard, and he made a profile of Adolf Hitler. Mm -hmm. This profile of Adolf Hitler is available online. You can read it. Uh, it was declassified in 1978. And similarly, Eric Fromm, who was a very famous psychoanalyst, he made a pro profiles of Stalin and Hitler. Mm -hmm. And from the little that I know about Putin, I know little, but I know much more than most people. Yeah? So from the little that I know, he is very, very close in, in psychology mm -hmm. or psychopathology to Stalin and Hitler. Very. Mm -hmm. He is not um, as dysregulated as Stalin and Hitler. Uh, but he is very close psychologically to them, both mm -hmm. of them. Does he have, is there anyone, anyone who, who he respects? Respects? In, in, no. the, in the inner circle? He respects, no, but trusts, yes. Who? He trusts two or three people. Mm -hmm. He trusts, uh, two, and the most trusted person is a guy called Shoigu, who is mm -hmm. the Minister of Defense. Mm -hmm. He trusts a guy called Prigozhin, but Prigozhin is an animal, he's a thug, he's a bully. Putin is, Putin is a bum. He's a bum, he's a thug, he's a bully, he's a delinquent criminal. Criminal. His early life was the life of a small, small-time criminal, mm -hmm. petty criminal. He failed to join the KGB several times. The KGB rejected him. 
as unfit material. Mm -hmm. Finally, they hired him and they let him deal only with documents. They wouldn't let him mm -hmm. touch anything. So in, in Berlin, where he was stationed, he was dealing with documents. His job was to burn the documents quickly yeah. when they vacated the... He's a small-time crook, failure, and criminal. He took, he took over probably as a puppet. Mm -hmm. same, same process exactly like Adolf Hitler. Adolf Hitler was a puppet. He was a puppet for industrialists and so on. They thought they could control him. They said, okay, we'll put this puppet mm -hmm. as prime minister, councillor. Hitler's first government was a minority government. Hitler had only one-third of the ministers. Two-thirds of the ministers belonged to, in, to the industrialists and businessmen in, in Germany. They thought they could control him. And then they discovered that they were wrong. Because a criminal doesn't play by any code. And even the greatest industrialist and plays by some code. Hitler, Putin, um, Stalin, and to much lesser extent people like Donald Trump, they don't play by any code. This is their strong point. Everyone around them assumes that it's possible to reach some kind of understanding, agreement, alliance, consensus, negotiated, compromise. It's not. Because they play by rules that are ever-changing. Even they don't play by their own code. Their own code changes. We call it identity disturbance. Mm -hmm. They have identity disturbance. So they're never the same. They're never the same person. For example, Putin. Putin, until, I would say, 2011, was pro-Western. Extreme pro-Western guy. And then suddenly he became a Russian Orthodox nationalist and, mm -hmm. and anti-Western. And he was pro-Western with the same conviction that he was anti-Western. They're not stable. Mm -hmm. They're not stable because they don't exist. These, there's, no, there's no human being there. There's an emptiness. There's no human being. Even authoritarian figures like uh, Bolsonaro or mm -hmm. um, Duterte at the time in the Philippines, and even authoritarian figures usually become authoritarian because there's nobody inside. There's no, nothing inside. So they try to compensate via the outside. Mm -hmm. They try to control their environment because they can't control themselves. So... This is the case of Putin. That's why I am pretty convinced that he will have no trouble whatsoever to use a nuclear weapon. weapon. Mm -hmm. Because he doesn't play by any rules. That was a mistake of the West. They thought he plays by some rules. Some rules. Okay, not all the rules, but some rules. No. No rules. None. Mm -hmm. And what do you think that, what would happen, I mean, it's a silly question, but what would happen if he just passed away suddenly? Because there are opinions, and there are they're a much worse person than, than he is, mentally. There's no, one, there's no one around him who can replace him right now. Mm -hmm. Everyone around him is a derivative, a shadow of uh, Putin, was created by Putin. Mm -hmm. depends, depends on Putin for continued existence. Even many of the oligarchs in, in Russia, even very, very independent oligarchs, are actually depe uh, cr critically dependent on Putin's good. So, they all depend on Putin's goodwill. Putin also created alter an alternative state. He has his own army, three million people. Three million people, not the Red Army, his own army. He also finances mercenaries like the Wagner Group, which are controlled by Prigozhin. He, he has his own administration. For example, everyone thinks that um, the government is important in Russia. The government is meaningless in Russia. Meaningless, zero, nothing, no influence. Mm -hmm. Parliament, of course, the Duma, nonsense. He created his own administration, which is where the power is and where I have many friends. This, is, this administration is called Chief of Staff. So the Chief of Staff is a guy called Vaino. The number two is a guy called Kiryenko, who used to be Prime Minister. Mm -hmm. This is where the real power is. So he has an alternative state. He created the Red Guard. Um, or a guard, it's called the Gvardia, which is a militia. militia. It's, it is fully equipped with tanks, with everything. Mm -hmm. Should the, it's exactly like Hitler. Hitler created the Schutzstaffel, the SS. SS was not <coughs> part of the state. It's a big mistake. SS was the, the army of the party, 
of the of the Nazi party. Mm-hmm. And so the SS was Hitler's private army. It was not part of the state. Later, the SS consumed the state, but it started as private army of Hitler. Same with the Putin. He has parallel structures mm-hmm. that are. So he's not dependent on the state. He's not dependent on institution. He's not dependent on public opinion. He's not dependent on oligarchs. He controls all the oligarchs with iron fist. There mm-hmm. is no replacement for Putin now. Mm-hmm. Should Putin die tomorrow, there will be a civil war in Russia. Thousands will be executed in the streets by r- rival factions. Mm-hmm. So, for example, in the KGB, in the FSB of today, there are several departments, like Department 6 and so on. They hate each other and they are arresting each other. Mm-hmm. The, one FSB department is attacking another FSB department. There is an FSB department which is called, which is uh, which deals with supervision, supervision of other departments. They constantly arrest FSB generals and colonels and send them to, you know. There is an infighting already going on. The south of Russia, which is the area of Krasnodar, Rostov, that area where I used to lecture, mm-hmm. uh, that area is anti-Putin. Severely anti-Putin, because the elites of this area, the oligarchs, the local politicians, and so on, they are they uh, don't like uh, Putin's it- intervention in their affairs. Mm-hmm. Putin established a second capital in uh, South Russia. He has a palace in South Russia, which is estimated to have cost three to five billion dollars and was exposed by Navalny. Mm-hmm. That's in South Russia. It's in. Uh, uh, Gelesnik, it's a, an area about four or five hours from Krasnodar. There's also a hotel, the Kempinski Hotel, mm-hmm. used to be Kempinski. So, and, and, and Putin has all his meetings, all his international meetings with leaders like Erdogan and so on in Sochi. Sochi mm-hmm. is in South Russia. I in, that. Yeah, he, he doesn't meet people in Moscow, it's very rare. He meets them in Sochi. Mm-hmm. So he, is, he gradually transitioned himself and his team to South Russia. The oligarchs there don't like it. And uh, so he, there are local politicians which represent actually Putin, help him to falsify real estate transactions and so on and so forth. And these politicians are resented by the oligarchs. The oligarchs hate them. So already in Russia, there are many civil wars, many civil wars going on. What about the war? The war in it's Ukraine? Yeah. The war in Ukraine will stop. The elites are against the war in Ukraine. Mm-hmm. Even his own inner circle is against the war. This one was not for Bangladesh, but it was for Bangladesh. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And the main one for the I have to tell you is Bulakov, you know, his uh, secretary. You know, and what do you think that why why didn't Putin kill Navalny? He's in prison now. The, the story is that he tried to kill him. He tried to kill him many times, but uh, mm-hmm. he came back to Russia. He had the opportunity to... I wouldn't kill him if I were Putin. I would make an example out of him. Mm-hmm. Why to kill him? I would make an... I kill people who are serious threat. I would kill people who are serious threat. For example, Nemtsov. Nemtsov had a political base and was a leader of Russia for a while. A mm-hmm. dominant figure in Russian politics for a while. And Nemtsov did represent the deep, deep strata of progressive liberal Russia middle class Russia, the Russians would travel a lot, the Russians were open to the world, the Russians speak languages, the Russians who consume Western consumer products, Nemtsov was their man. Mm-hmm. He was young, he was affable, he was educated, he was... so he was a real friend. So he was killed on the bridge, meters from the Kremlin. But Navalny is not a real Navalny friend. is not a real friend. He's a clown between you and me. He's a clown. But he needs, he's perfect to make an example of. This is what will happen to you if you dare to attack mm-hmm. me. You know? mm-hmm. This is what I will do to you if you dare to attack me. Mm-hmm. He's much more useful alive than dead. Which is one of the reasons I found it very difficult to believe that Putin ordered his poisoning. It is so, it's such a stupid move. Even Putin is, uh, Putin is not stupid. Putin is extremely intelligent and sharp man. Speaks several languages. He's versed in literature. He's very educated, self-educated man. He's a criminal and a thug, but an uh, educated criminal. So I don't think any sharp is cunning, he's sharp. So I don't believe he, he ordered the poisoning. I think someone tried to please Putin by by trying to kill Navalny and then saying, bringing Navalny's head to Putin. You know, I killed Navalny. 
I think it was lo initiative, local initiative of the, K of the FSP. But I don't think Putin ordered it, because Navalny is much more valuable alive than mm -hmm. dead. He is a perfect example of what would happen to you if you dare to speak out. Even if you're not a real threat, you will end, you will end up not having a life. Mm -hmm. A real threat was Nemtsov, political threat, he was killed. Khodorkovsky, for example, was never a real threat. He tried to, tried to enter politics, but he was an oligarch. Mm -hmm. So the way to punish an oligarch is to take away his money. The way to punish a real political threat is to kill him. The way to punish someone who exposes real corruption, the corruption that underlies the regime, network of patronage and so on, is to kill, for example, the, um, this famous uh, female journalist. Yeah. But if you are just uh, essentially a YouTuber, <laughs> Slavani is a YouTuber, yes. Essentially, you are just on YouTube and you know you make all kinds of claims, however well substantiated. You are useful as a as a no, you know, in all courts in medieval Europe, in all the courts, there was a jester. A jester was a clown, and this jester was the only one allowed to say the truth about the king. He had this permission. Uh -huh. That's Navalny. He's, a, he's the court jester. Mm -hmm. What? Uh, what? Do you think about Sirovitis? Sirovitis, any uh, Nazi uh, person, than people than the oligarchs, for example? No, no. Oligarchs are the rich ones. Mm -hmm. Siloviki are, are former members of the security services. Mm -hmm. This is the inner circle, no? Right? It's the inner circle. It's, a, it's the innermost circle yeah. of... Uh, there used to be many, many Siloviki, but today there are maybe three or four left. Um, many of them are arrested by the others. Each other, arresting each other, killing each other, and so yeah. So today there are maybe three or four left. Yeah. Slovakia are ex uh, members of the security services, especially from Leningrad, Leningrad area, where mm -hmm. he was in the local KGB. And um, they are not about money, they're about power. They're not, of course, all of them are rich, but it's not about money. Most of the oligarchs, even small scale oligarchs, are much richer than Slovakia. Mm -hmm. But Slovakia has the power. So they can destroy an oligarch, build an oligarch, invent an oligarch, put Navalny in prison, poison Navalny. That's why I think one of the Siloviki tried to poison Navalny to please Putin. And so on and so forth. They're out of control. Even uh, Putin is afraid of them. They are quite out of control. They have their own king, king, kingdoms, their own kingdoms within the FSB. So there is a Siloviki associated with Department 6 in the FSB, uh, uh, someone associated with Department 3. So. They have their fiefdoms, their kingdoms. They compete with each other on power and access to Putin. And um, they also have their own small equivalent militaries, like small militias. Mm -hmm. uh, these militias are mainly security services. Now, some of them, the clever ones, they made an alliance with Putin's personal army. So, for example, in some cities in the south, like, for example, Krasnodar, or so, the local branch of the private army of Putin is working with the F local branch of the FSB under supervision of one of the Siloviki in Moscow. Mm -hmm. So they are beginning to be collaborations and alliances between the security services, the active security services, and... Uh, the, the militias, Putin's militias, Siloviki's militias, and so on. In effect, there is a Lebanization. This, uh, Russia is becoming like Lebanon. Like Lebanon. You have territories. Each territory is controlled by an alliance between a militia and security services. This alliance dictates to oligarchs and to politicians what to do. It places politicians in power. It enriches oligarchs or destroys oligarchs. And each has its own territory, a little like the mafia in the, mm -hmm. in the 30s and 40s in New York, which has its own territory. And they don't enter each other's territory. Russia, in this sense, is disintegrating. It's falling apart. The only glue that is ho holding everything together is Putin. Should Putin die mysteriously, uh, not mysteriously, then Russia will descend into a horrendous civil war. Of course, the war in Ukraine will stop, but there will be a horrendous civil war in Russia. No, mm -hmm. do we want this? Mm -hmm. These people have access to 2,000 nuclear warheads. At the minimum, in the best scenario, 
they will sell these nuclear weapons in the best scenario if they don't use them. But they will sell them. This is exactly what happened after USSR disintegrated. After USSR disintegrated, uh, nuclear warheads, biochemical weapons, and so on, they were sold in the open market. You could buy a nuclear warhead. You could buy, you know, do and but luckily Western governments organized immediately and they bought most of these weapons. They bought mm -hmm. the the local authorities in USSR after USSR fell apart, sold nuclear weapons to the West. So the West was buying. There was a special program, for example, in the United States to buy nuclear weapons from these criminals. You know? Should Russia disintegrate now? Because Russia now is anti-Western. And because countries like China will not buy nuclear weapons from Russia. Yeah? Mm -hmm. So they will sell these weapons to terrorists. To mm -hmm. terrorists. To... This would be a, <laughs> this would be a mega calamity. Mm -hmm. We we want Russia to remain strong. It is the interest of the West for Putin to survive. That's nonsense that the West wants Putin gun. The West, mm -hmm. Had the West wanted Putin gun, Putin would be gun. Uh -huh. But the West needs Putin to remain in power because there's no alternative, not because he's a good guy. He's not a good guy. He's an animal. Mm -hmm. He's an absolute animal. And everyone thinks it. All oligarchs, all, everyone thinks mm -hmm. in Russia that he's an animal. This is Putin. But... Wars, wars don't always, wars can never start if there is no popular will, even if there is a dictator. The strongest dictator cannot start a war without the popular will, even Adolf Hitler. Adolf Hitler hesitated many times to start a war because he had a secret, um, Hitler had a secret unit, and this secret unit was giving him reports about the real mood and the real a gossip in population. So he, he, Hitler was fully updated every minute what people were really saying about him, what mm -hmm. they were really thinking. And many times he postponed military adventures because the mood was not good. Was not. Uh... Putin started the war because he has the full support of a segment, the biggest segment of the population of Russia. Russia, exactly like Turkey, exactly like Brazil, exactly like many other countries, potentially Hungary, I don't know enough. Russia, in Russia, there is a revolt against the elites. The global phenomenon is a war against the elites. The masses rose up, and with the help of empowering and enabling technologies, the masses are using these technologies to destroy the elites. There is a hatred of elites not only financial elites, not only political elites, but also, for example, intellectual elites. Mm -hmm. There's a hatred of experts, authors, intellectuals, huge hatred. In the United States, this hatred is bordering on homicidal, homicidal hatred. I mean, I strongly suspect that the base of Donald Trump would be pretty happy to hang two, three hundred intellectuals, you know, because they are they advocate transgender or they advocate yeah. feminism or you know. The, the hatred is growing and becoming violent. And so in many countries, populist leaders, demagogues, wannabe dictators and so on, they realize this and they team up with the peasants, with the less educated, with the ignorant, with the stupid. They team up with this part of the population against the elites. Their mm -hmm. platform is, I'm against the elites, mm -hmm. like Donald Trump. Um, I'm going to clean the swamp, drain the swamp in Washington. Yeah? So, Putin is the same. Putin is massively popular among the segments of the population in Russia, which are rural, agricultural, ignorant, ill-educated, superstitious, stupid, mm -hmm. uh, never traveled outside, never traveled outside Russia, hate the West, regard the West as satanic, um, Putin just gave a speech, and he said the philosophy of the West, the values of the West, are a form of Satanism. Putin, mm -hmm. not, a, not some crazy orthodox uh, priest in some forgotten village. Putin. So Putin teamed up with these people to attack the elites. The elites, all of them belonged to Yeltsin at the time. These were Harvard-educated or you know, Western-educated people. 
and they spoke languages and so on. Putin now is in the position of Erdogan. Same. Mm -hmm. Erdogan is doing the same. You know, he teams up with the peasants, with the religious people, with the, against the urban elites in Istanbul, in, say, Bolsonaro, and, and Lula, the same. This dynamic is universal. Donald Trump okay. is universal dynamic. So this war is not only about Ukraine. This war is an instrument of Putin to create a base against the elites. He needs to destroy the elites. Mm -hmm. The war in Ukraine is a way to destroy the elites because if you're against the war, you're not patriotic. And you go to jail for 15 years, by the way, if you say anything against the war. And who will speak against the war? A peasant? A religious person, a superstitious idiot in, in some village, they will not speak up against the war. Authors will speak against the war. Intellectuals will speak against the war. Bloggers will speak against the war. These are the, these are the people he wants to destroy, the Navalny's. He wants them to speak against the war. So he's using the war not only to obtain, to capture the Donbass. I think the Donbass was the only target of the war. Not Kiev, not Shmir, not all this bullshit. He wants the, the Donbass. But he's using the war as a domestic tool, a tool for domestic management to eliminate the last remaining possibility for opposition against him and to solidify his base, solidify it. Mm -hmm. It's very surprising that Trump didn't start the war, as many people predicted, because Trump could have used the war to solidify his base and destroy mm -hmm. the elites. Maybe that was his mistake. Mm -hmm. Just some pictures. And the last question, Zelensky, it's very short. What do you think about him? About? About Zelensky. Zelensky? Yeah. Zelensky is Jewish. I cannot say anything bad about oh. him. <laughs> <laughs> He's a good actor also. So he went into the role smoothly. <laughs> and uh, He's an amazing uh, man, regardless of whether you agree with his politics. Because don't forget, before the Ukraine, Ukrainian war, before the war in Ukraine, Zelensky was becoming more and more authoritarian, dictatorial. Yeah. He suppressed the opposition, he suppressed speech, he put people in prison. Mm -hmm. He allowed, he allowed pro-Nazi and other elements to take over parts of the military and parts of the security establishment. Mm -hmm. Maybe because he was afraid. You never know until you are in his shoes. You never know what, what, what was the reason. Mm -hmm. But he did allow it. In this sense, the Russian propaganda is not very far from the truth. There are very strong pro-Nazi and, and far-right elements in, in Ukraine. Zelensky was going absolutely the wrong way before the Ukraine war. If you read the, the Western media before the Ukraine war, they were beginning to regard Zelensky as a kind of author, a dictator yeah, in the making. Yeah. And so, but... This, this war redeemed him, and he's a great man. Uh, he was made great by circumstances, but I, I admire this, the way he manages mm -hmm. um, all this. Zelensky is only, I think, mistake, and I attribute it to his lack of experience. A really experienced politician and statesman never, never uh, commits himself to a red line or to a principle. Because the minute you do this, you're in a corner. Mm -hmm. you're, you're stuck with your own words. You're trapped by your own words. So to say, for example, I would never accept any territorial concessions and I will never stop the war until we have Crimea back. That's not wise. Not wise because it limits his options, not Putin's options. He is limiting himself. So he's very inexperienced and he is, I think, still in the role of the president and the uh, television. <laughs> and he makes these repeated statements, which I think uh, would make it extremely difficult for him to, to finish the war. And there is no way that he can militarily reconquer these territories. Russia didn't really start the war yet. It didn't really start the war yet. Russia could have obliterated all the cities of Ukraine within two weeks had it wanted to, but he doesn't want to. So if he, if he refuses to communicate, refuses to negotiate, refuses, if he has red lines which are unrealistic, if he expects to win this war, 
he will lose the support of the West. He will end up losing the support of the West. Mm -hmm. Because no one will tolerate a five euro war yeah. with 10% uh, inflation every year and energy prices which are doubling every year. No one will tolerate this. There's a limit to how much we, we are willing to sacrifice for Ukraine. But he has to negotiate? He has to, he has to, he has to make territorial concessions. Uh -huh. When you're faced with a stronger neighbor, this, the only option is realpolitik. Mm -hmm. It's not fair, it's not moral, it's horrible, but it's reality. And the only politic is realpolitik. There is a, a mismatch between the resources of Russia and the resources of Ukraine. The West cannot compensate for that. Russia can raise an army of 3 million people. Most of it will be bad army, corrupt army, inefficient army, yes, but it's still 3 million people. You know? Russia can, for example, bomb all Ukrainian cities into dust if it wishes. It didn't yet, but it can. Not using nuclear weapons, even. Mm -hmm. It didn't use, for example, its advanced tanks, it didn't use its advanced artillery, it did not use advanced aircraft. In, in Ukraine. It is, Russia is trying to not destroy Ukraine completely, but it can. So at some point you have to accept that you have a crazy, stronger neighbor who is criminally, who is antisocial, psychopathic neighbor. You have to accept this and you have to make concessions. And But he's now not open to concessions because he de declared that he will not make concessions. And he's going to lose the support of the West. And then it will be over for him. So, I think... And we have the right politicians at home, like in Sweden, for example, Italy, here. Yes. Well, yes, it, the right thing. It's, this is what I'm saying. He will lose the support yeah. of the West. It will manifest through elections and so on, but yeah. yes, he will lose the support of the West. I give him another... I give him until the next winter. That means he next will... Next winter in 2023? Yeah, yes, until let's say September 2023. Uh, uh, people will survive this winter and they will survive this summer. It's mm -hmm. okay, spring and summer. But if no one will agree to enter a second winter on these conditions. Yeah, I think so. No. So he has, this is his window. This is his window. Can he within, within a year, 12 months, can he recapture these territories, which are 21% of the territory of Ukraine? Mm -hmm. Can he recapture Crimea? This is a joke. This is a pipe dream. Yeah. No way on earth he can do this. Mm -hmm. Not to mention the, the unfortunate fact that the majority of the population in, in the Donbass are pro-Russian. It's not nice to say, but they're very happy that the Russians came in. Mm -hmm. So you have to accept life. You can negotiate, you can compromise somehow. For example, you can say, let's have a joint control of Donbass, or let's share the resources of Donbass, or let's um, give Donbass uh, some autonomy, or you can be creative in how you negotiate, but you need to negotiate and you should never ever declare red lines and principle. Only inexperienced political statement is doing this. Mm -hmm. okay. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, just some pictures we take. One thing we did not discuss was the mental mental health uh, epidemic in Ukraine after the war. Was that the government? Are the government in Ukraine? If you want, yeah. okay. because I think it's important. No one is mentioning. Yeah, because I've seen the interview with you, and we're talking about. No one is mentioning this, but yes. it's a disaster. Yeah. 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 And I just talk it to you. I forget English. I'm very sorry. So, PTSD in Ukraine. So that that would be that should be expected after the war or during the war. Of course, post-traumatic stress disorder will be much more common in Ukraine than in Russia, but it will happen in Russia as well. Mm -hmm. Already, about half a million uh, young Russian men had to escape Russia in very difficult conditions on foot, and they escape Russia to countries which don't like Russia, like Georgia. Mm -hmm. So these young men. Um, are likely to be traumatized. Many of them have families. They left the family behind. Many refugees are leaving Ukraine and going into Russia. They get in touch with the local population. So this is what we call vicarious or secondary trauma. But of course, the major trauma will be in Ukraine. 
There are many women raped, many children lost their families, about one third of children actually lost their families, uh, many women raped. Uh, almost everyone experienced a rocket attack, which I experienced a rocket attack. I lived in Israel mm -hmm. when Saddam Hussein was attacking with rockets my city. And so I was sitting in the shelter when all the buildings around me were destroyed by rockets. I know how it feels. It's very traumatizing. Now, Ukraine, like many, many other countries in the world, is not prepared to deal with the aftermath of the war. They are so focused on the war, normally, that they are not planning or considering or training people to cope with the outcomes of the war. A war has outcomes which are economic, a war has outcomes in infrastructure, but one of the most neglected aspects of war is the mental health outcomes. By a conservative estimate, one third of the population of Ukraine will suffer from PTSD. That is an unprecedented uh, situation. Um, maybe in, the, in World War II, maybe 5% experience uh, post-traumatic conditions. And the reason is that World War II, uh, ex with the exception of some cases, World War II was fought basically on the fault lines, on the borders, and, and so on. This is a war inside the country. This is what we call a total war, involving the population as soldiers. So the populations are going to react exactly like soldiers. PTSD among soldiers is much higher than among the normal population. And there is no one to treat them. No one to treat them. People with PTSD cannot function, cannot sleep, cannot work. Cannot, uh, they have nightmares, they have flashbacks. When they have flashbacks, they lose contact with reality and they live in the past, in the event that traumatizes them. Um, how is Ukraine going to be rebuilt if one third of the population is zombie? It's a zombie state. Mm -hmm. So no one is thinking about this. Even the West doesn't have any program in place to train uh, Ukrainian psychologists and psychiatrists to cope with this. Uh, the number of psychologists and psychiatrists uh, required to deal with PTSD in Ukraine must go up by 500 times. We need to have 500 times more psychologists and psychiatrists than they have today. You realize that the, uh, the effort must start now. We must train. And because you will never have enough psychologists and psychiatrists, we must begin to train uh, regular people, normal people, to help other people with PTSD. And we must reconstruct communities. The best resolution of PTSD is when you have a community, family. Mm -hmm. So we need to begin to reconstruct villages. And if we cannot reconstruct, reconstruct them in reality, we need to reconstruct them online. We need to create communities online. And we need to create support networks. We need, as I said, to train regular people, teachers, you know, regular people to deal with this. None of this is being done. None of this is being planned even. So we're going to have a Ukraine at the end of the war. Let's assume the war will end in one year. We're going to have a Ukraine that is mentally ill, disabled and paralyzed. Totally zombified. With no ability to perform even the most basic functions. All infrastructure collapsing. Institutions are dead and so on and so forth. Just because we didn't invest minimally. Don't need much money for it. Uh, uh, right now in planning for the mental health epidemic. Mm -hmm. That's how I see it. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Claudia. Does, does the speaker agree? Are you going to Ukraine to help them? Because they didn't they agree. They, they, did, they didn't let me in. No, 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 no. Because they, they didn't give me the security. Yeah. Yeah. They said that I'm, I'm too close to Russia. I've lived too long in Russia. I know the oligarchs, I know the politicians, so they can't be sure that I'm not a Russian spy. Yeah. So they refuse to let me. Mm -hmm. So I, I lost Russia and I lost Ukraine <laughs> as well. So I'm in Hungary. <laughs> Were you sorry that you cannot do so? I wanted very much Ukraine, the Ukrainians. I even yeah. suggested, okay, I cannot enter Ukraine, bring them out. And mm -hmm. I will train them. Uh, I'm teaching in the outreach program, or oh, how about in Princeton and all the big things? Mm -hmm. They have a consortium called CS. CS is an outreach program, mm -hmm. a program to teach in poorer countries. So 
outreaches in Nigeria, Serbia, Venezuela, these kind of countries. <laughs> so I worked for Harvard in effect. And so Harvard approached me and said, you know, can you train the, these people? And then the Ministry of Defense. But now that I'm gone, in mm -hmm. effect, they, so the, as far as I know, maybe I'm wrong, but they didn't find an alternative. Mm -hmm. So the whole thing was dropped. Mm -hmm. Like, okay, we did. We thought we could do it with Wagner, we cannot do it with Wagner, forget the whole thing. So they dropped the whole thing. As far as I know, maybe I'm wrong. Mm -hmm. This is disaster. We need to begin to train, by my estimate, half a million people. Mm -hmm. to treat PTSD. Mm -hmm. Like we are training people for CPR, you know, we're training them CPR is when you have a heart attack, mm -hmm. and you know, this, yes, 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 yes. even normal people, you don't have to be a doctor to give CPR, mm -hmm. you know, you can, I can train you in first aid. We need to train people, neighbors, teachers, to help when you see flashback. When you see someone with flashback, what to do? When you see someone crying all the time, so what to do? We need to train many people to help each other. Mm -hmm. And we need to re-establish communities. If there is a village is destroyed completely, we need to take all the people of this village and put them in one place, mm -hmm. not separate them, not distribute them. Mm -hmm. They are not distributed. So there is a whole village. One family goes here, one family to Germany, one family to Romania, one family to Ukraine. Instead of keeping the village intact in one place, these are critical things, and I'm very worried that after the war, the train will be in catastrophic state. Uh, I never saw a society with uh, this high level of PTSD. It would be interesting to, uh, mm -hmm. academically <laughs> to observe this. Academically. And in Russia, uh, what, what, what do you teach exactly? Where? At the in Russia? Yes, yes, yes. Clinical psychology. Clinical and neuroscience. Uh -huh. yeah. I'm teaching in uh, in CIAPS. CIAPS is the group of universities, so mm -hmm. the outreach program. There, I'm teaching psychology and uh, sexuality and mm -hmm. uh, finance also. As mm -hmm. a professor mm -hmm. of finance, so it's a beautiful thing what they're doing. This is the biggest universities in the world: Harvard, Princeton, Yale, um, Hebrew University from mm -hmm. Jerusalem. The biggest universities. They made consortium. It's called CIAPS, mm -hmm. and uh, CIAPS goes to countries, poor countries and they bring the syllabus of the prestigious university to the poor people. So the poor people in Nigeria, for example, they receive same education like Harvard. Mm -hmm. Same, identical, same syllabus. Mm -hmm. same. And, and if there is no building or something, the Harvard go, they build the building. So in Nigeria, for example, we built, we constructed a whole university, a whole building, campus, everything. Well, free, mm -hmm. free of charge, and mm -hmm. we are teaching these people free of charge. You have to be, you have to have doctorate to come into the outreach program. You have to have PhD um, from a, from one of these universities. You have to have PhD, and you have to well after that you have to work in your own country for five years mm -hmm. and so on. It's a nice initiative. I am I, I designed the psychology curriculum psychology syllabus and I designed the finance syllabus and now they asked me to be uh, like in charge of CIAPS and, but I uh, don't want I don't want to be in charge of CIAPS because this is administration I don't like administration Stop apologizing. My, my pleasure. Don't worry. I'm happy to see you. I love it. Nice to meet you. I'm happy to see you. I wanted to tell you that you you sent me two links uh, with some inter uh, with two interviews, and there was an interview with a black lady, Afro-American lady from the United States. But this lady was terrible. I, I was so disappointed. Not United States, United Kingdom. You remember? You remember? Trisha. Remember? Trisha. Trisha. Yeah. This uh, black woman. Yeah, she's very famous in the United Kingdom. I'm sorry. Yeah. I'm so irritated by her. Yeah. Can you go to Mashboard or hard copy? It, 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 uh, e? Uh -huh. It's a picture of my flash. Oh, 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 oh. Uh -huh. it, was like he, it was like she didn't know anything about narcissism. And, uh, she is uh, famous in the United Kingdom because she says politically incorrect things. 
against yeah. feminism, against yeah. this, against that. Yeah. And she said about Meghan Merkel. Meghan Merkel, oh. And she, so she is very famous for saying crazy things that everyone, provoke everyone. So. Don't, don't, don't start off. She's likable. I spoke to her before. The, 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 the woman? The, this woman is likable. She's I thought not Meghan Merkel. Not Meghan Merkel. <laughs> but this woman is likable. I like her. For me too, Meghan Merkel is a top psycho. Yeah. I, it's I, very dangerous. I heard from many people. I don't like to say anything if I don't study very deeply. Mm -hmm. So I, I don't know her enough mm -hmm. to say anything. Putin I know a lot. <laughs> Putin, about Putin I know a lot. So I feel comfortable what I say. But this Meghan Merkel, I don't know her. I did not even look online. She bores me. <laughs> she bores me. Yes, she bores me. She bores me. Really? Yeah. Hey, you can see it. Yeah. Oops. Yeah, it's a new word. You have a new word. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Yeah.